Good to have you tuned in. It's Tuesday, February 8th here in Korea. There have been a number of changes in Korea's COVID-19 strategy starting earlier this week, and we have medical pundits weighing in on these adjustments later on the program. We start now with the broader pandemic update with our Kwon Soa. So let's begin with the tallies for Korea on this Tuesday. Sunny, there has been an uptick in COVID-19 infections this Tuesday. More than 36,700 cases were tallied as of 12 a.m. And this marks the highest number for a Tuesday. And it includes 36,619 domestic transmissions and exactly 100 cases from abroad. Now, not all places across the country have reported an uptick this Tuesday, but here in the capital region, we see that uh, while Seoul has uh, reported a decline, there's been a record high in both Incheon and Gyeonggi-do province, Gyeonggi-do province with over 12,000 infections for the first time in a single day. And it's not looking much better in many other places across uh, the country. And uh, meanwhile, we've been in the more than 30,000 cases for the past three days and uh, four days, that is. And today's figure is around the double uh, caseload that we saw last uh, Tuesday. And with that, Korea has now more than 1 million cases, 1 million and 80, 1,681, and also 6,922 fatalities. 36 people uh, have lost their lives in the past 24 hours. And uh, if we go over to the number of patients that are in serious or critical condition, uh, that number has declined again slightly to 268. And uh, the vaccination figures now, we've got uh, a little under 44.7 million people who got one shot of COVID-19 vaccine and 44.1 million that are fully vaccinated. Also, 28.4 million or roughly 55 percent of the nation's population has received an additional COVID-19 uh, vaccine shot. Uh, going abroad, we've got uh, around 2.1 million additional cases as of noon Korea time around the globe and more than 9,800 additional fatalities and uh, there has been a decline in some places around the world however uh, places that are still seeing six digit figures of increases are Germany and also uh, Russia and those are the general updates that I have for now but I'll see you back in a bit Sunny all right, so thank you for those tallies. Now, let's take a closer look at the COVID-19 situation here in the country. I have Choi Min-jong in the studio for details on that. Min-jong, welcome. Thank you for having me. Right, let's start with the growing number of COVID-19 patients being treated at home, Min-jong. Right, Sunny, Korea added 12,000 new home treatment patients over a single day period. This brings the total to nearly 160,000 patients, and more than half of them came from the greater Seoul area. Health authorities are predicting our daily tally to reach as many as 170,000 by the end of February. And given this scenario, the number of people recovering from home is on pace to hit the 1 million mark by early March. Right, 1 million mark then. And that is precisely why Minjong authorities shared their intentions to streamline their management of home patients, right? Right. Health authorities on Monday announced that home treatment would be geared towards those at high risk. Patients recovering at home will be divided into two categories, an intensive management group and a regular management group. Um, those eligible to receive intensive care will be people aged 60 and above or those taking oral COVID-19 pills. Treatment kits, which include fever medication, thermometers and self-test equipment, will only be provided to those in the intensive management group, and they'll continue to get two daily health checks. Those who are asymptomatic or have mild symptoms will fall under the um, regular management group, and they will not be provided with treatment kits and will no longer be actively monitored. Right, Minjung, and that is something that Soa mentioned earlier on Monday, but what is the protocol for patients whose symptoms suddenly take a turn for the worse? Well, if their symptoms worsen, they can contact their local um, hospital or clinic to access remote health care services, or they can pay an in-person visit to an outpatient treatment center. People are not required to inform authorities when they're leaving their homes for this purpose. If their health conditions worsen late at night, when many local clinics have closed for the day, they would have to call the Home Treatment Support Center for assistance. Um, every major region in the country has a pool of doctors and nurses on standby, ready to respond at any time. Right. Now, Minja, you just mentioned that COVID-19 patients at home can choose to venture outdoors for medical purposes. What about family members who are isolating at the same household? Can they go out? 
right, they are allowed to go out only if they're picking up COVID-19 medication for um, the patient and their family or if they're shopping for basic necessities. Patients and family members under quarantine are no longer monitored with a tracking app, so it's extra important for them to practice individual prevention. Family members are only required to quarantine for seven days now. Before, people in the same household had to isolate for seven additional days after the patient had fully recovered. Right, Minjung, they did. Meanwhile, on the vaccination front, what is the latest on plans here in the country for fourth doses? Right, Sunny. Um, health authorities on Monday said they are planning to administer fourth doses to residents and staff at nursing centers and other care facilities. Um, say, they said this was mainly to prevent cluster and breakthrough infections at these venues. Data shows that a total of 66 cluster infections were reported in January at these locations, resulting in nearly 2,500 patients. So far in the month of February, we've seen an additional seven new clusters. What's also concerning is the relatively high rate of breakthrough infections among seniors who got their third shots. Although those infected with Omicron are less likely to become severely ill compared to the Delta variant, authorities say more hospitalizations are possible if more people at higher risk are infected. Authorities are also considering the use of Novavax vaccines for those who haven't yet received a jab. All right, Min Jung, thank you for now, but do stay behind for more talks. Also on the local front, the academic arena here has been granted autonomy in deciding the future course of learning arrangements amid Omicron. Our Shin Yoon has more. Just weeks before students start a new semester, the Ministry of Education on Monday released a new set of virus prevention measures for schools. First, to answer a question most parents want to know, will all students be required to go back to school? The short answer is yes. The Education Ministry said that it's set on pushing through its plans to bring all students back to the classroom. But the ministry added that it's now up to each school to determine whether to do that or not based on the pandemic situation in their respective regions. The ministry did suggest indicators that could help each school decide when to implement online classes, such as 3% of all students having been infected or 15% of all students being absent because they're under quarantine or have caught COVID-19. Another important question, Will schools expand their testing methods? Originally, schools have only been using PCR tests. But now, schools nationwide will also use rapid antigen test kits that only take 15 to 30 minutes. They'll also expand the number of special response teams that go to schools to conduct PCR tests. Students will then be able to receive their results within two hours. Schools will also prepare enough self-test kits for students to take if needed. Who can get tested and how? First, those who report symptoms after coming into close contact with a person infected with COVID-19 will be able to get a PCR test right away. Those who came into close contact but don't have any symptoms will have to test themselves with a rapid antigen test kit for a whole week. They must test themselves every other day and can only return to school if their results turn out negative. To make sure each school has enough testing kits, education boards nationwide will provide extra kits for 20% of all students and teachers in their region. As of now, already 6.5 million kits have been secured and can be used until the end of March. Shin Yeun, Arirang News. Now, beyond national borders, post-Lunar New Year holiday resurgences are being witnessed in quite a number of places in this part of the world. And I have Soa back at the desk with details on that. Right, Soa? Right, Sunny. Korea is not the only country that is back from the Lunar New Year holidays. Many countries in Asia, despite precautionary measures, are concerned over soaring host holiday COVID-19 cases, which are spurred by the Omicron variant. Uh, those concerns are also prevalent in Hong Kong, which is struggling with its zero COVID-19. 19 strategy as a record high of 614 local infections were posted on Monday with the number recently doubling every two to three days. The country was almost COVID-19 free in the second half of 2021, but the situation has changed ever since the highly transmissible Omicron variant emerged in late December. Authorities expect more increases in the coming days, considering it is a result of cluster infections that broke out during holiday events. 
Japan reported an all-time figure for a Monday with cases exceeding 68,000 as of Monday evening, whereas its average in the past week stands at above 90,000, with its recent all-time high having hit 100,000, above uh, 100,000. Now, according to Kyoto News, the J Japanese government is considering an extension of the quasi-state emergency in Tokyo and 12 prefectures by two weeks or until the end of the month. Restrictions that include business hours of restaurants and bars are currently to be in effect until Sunday. Right, and while restrictions are being maintained here in this part of the world, I understand countries in Europe are looking to ease their restrictions, right? That's right, Sunny. Um, starting this Friday, Italy will lift outdoor mask mandates, which are due to expire on Thursday. Health authorities have decided not to extend, extend the mandate, given the improving situation as they have seen around 40,000 cases in the past day. Things are also looking up in the UK. Uh, uh, the number of patients being admitted to an ICU dropped to as low as 20 a day. Around 400 people were being transferred to critical care in January last year. The Times attributed the decline to the less severe nature of the Omicron variant and the 65% booster rate in the UK. Now, the U.S., also a place where the Omicron variant appears to have peaked, has recently reported a drop by around 60 percent of cases in around half of its states. Now, California has now decided to ease mask rules for vaccinated people starting next week on the back of plunging cases. Now, meanwhile, according to CNN, the U.S. government is mulling over life after the pandemic, citing the White House, uh, saying federal officials are, quote, thinking about about what the next step will be after the U.S. transitions out of the current crisis into what people referred to as normalcy before the pandemic. But a plan has yet to be released, and uh, top U.S. infectious disease expert Anthony Fauci at a recent briefing said that for now it's unclear when COVID-19 will no longer pose a threat to people's daily lives, but that the direction into which the administration is moving is right, and that that is immunizing Americans. Right, so uh, meanwhile, over in Canada, so I understand authorities are not only working to contain COVID-19, but also very loud protests. Right, Sunny, and uh, just hours ago on uh, Monday night local time, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau also called on these protests to come to an end. Now, we're speaking about truck drivers in Ottawa that are continuing to stage demonstrations against vaccines and testing rules. Here you see it or heard it. Uh, these uh, protests have not only been criticized uh, by the government, but ordinary Canadian citizens as well. They were sparked by truckers back in January 29th who drove into the capital, Ottawa, in a show of objection against vaccine mandates that require truck drivers that enter Canada to be fully vaccinated or mandatory testings and uh, quarantine rules. Now, more protesters joined them with the protests having extended into anti-mask, lockdown and restriction gatherings rules as well and have been continuing throughout this weekend with thousands of participants. I support the truckers because they're standing up for freedom. Um, our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms has been violated in many, many ways. We're not allowed to cross the border. We're not allowed to go on planes or trains. We've been fired from jobs. On Sunday, the mayor of Ottawa declared a state of emergency and uh, the police says some 1,800 more officers are required to end this protest. No officers are on days off. Everyone has been working. We are stretched to the limit, but we are 100% committed to using everything we have to end this demonstration. Right, hopefully matters will be resolved peacefully there. Now lastly, in Australia, so I understand the country will soon open its borders to travellers from around the world. Yes, Sonny, for the first time in around two years, tourists will be allowed to travel to Australia, but only those who are vaccinated. Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced on Monday that the country is looking forward for the reopening and welcomes everyone back if they are double vaccinated. Borders to Australia will be open starting February 
February 21st after having closed them back in March 2020. Some foreign students and skilled migrants had been granted to enter since last December. Meanwhile, unvaccinated travelers will have to need a medical reason for not being vaccinated and uh, will have to apply for an exemption. But even if they do get that exemption and enter the country, they will have to quarantine according to local rules. I see. All right, so thank you very much for the latest from around the world in here. And Min Jung, thank you too. I'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you. In our headlines at this hour, a press briefing was held by Korea's athletic delegates to the Beijing Winter Games earlier on this Tuesday to address the controversy surrounding events on the speed skating rink earlier Monday evening. Our Min Su-kyun reports. A press conference was held Tuesday morning by the head of South Korea's athletic delegation, Yoon hong gun over last night's refereeing decisions at the short track speed skating event. Yoon said a letter of protest was immediately sent to the International Skating Union and to the International Olympic Committee with a request to meet the IOC president. He stressed that unfair decisions against South Korean athletes should not be made at future international sporting events. The Korea Sport and Olympic Committee is also planning to file an appeal with the Court of Arbitration for Sport to address the issue. Monday night's short track speed skating came as a crushing disappointment. Many South Korean fans found it hard to believe that none of South Korea's three semi-finalists reached the final in the men's 1,000-meter race. Hwang Dae-hun, the world record holder in the event, crossed the finish line first in his semi-final heat. But he was later disqualified for making an illegal late pass that caused contact. Chinese skaters Lan Ju Wei and Lee Wen Lung thereby advanced to the finals. In the next heat, Lee jun finished the race in second place, but he was also penalized for making a lane change that caused contact with Lee Xia Wang of Hungary. And earlier, a third South Korean skater, Park Chang-hyuk, withdrew from the semifinals after injuring his left hand during his 1,000-meter quarterfinal heat. Meanwhile, at the women's 500-meter sprint, Choi Min-jung failed to get past the quarterfinals. With just two laps left in the four-and-a-half lap race, Choi unfortunately slipped and fell without contact. The short track speed skating event will resume on Wednesday with the men's 1,500-meter and the women's 1,000-meter and 3,000-meter relay. Min suk Kyun, Arirang News. On the international front, efforts to form a diplomatic shield around Ukraine continue amid the growing presence of Russian military along the Ukrainian border. In the most recent show of solidarity, Washington and Berlin have warned Moscow of severe repercussions. Kim Yosan has more. The leaders of the U.S. and Germany are presenting a united front against possible Russian military aggression against Ukraine. Following their first face-to-face -face meeting at the White House Monday, President Biden said the two countries are working hand-in-hand -hand to address Russia's continued military buildup along the Ukraine border. Germany is one of America's closest allies, We're working on lockstep to further deter Russian aggression in Europe and to address the challenges posed by China and promote stability in the Western Balkans. The German Chancellor also stressed coordination between the two countries. We are closest allies and we are working intensely together and this is necessary for doing the steps that we have to do, for instance, fighting against Russian aggression against Ukraine. The two leaders also said they will seek to de-escalate tensions in a diplomatic manner, declaring they share the same view that it's the best solution. In case of a Russian invasion of Ukraine, however, they added Moscow would face serious consequences, including strong sanctions. Their meeting comes as Germany's defense minister announced plans to send up to 350 more troops to Lithuania, a move aimed at bolstering NATO's eastern flank. This all coming as the leaders of France and Russia held talks in Moscow and the highest profile intervention yet by a Western leader to try and ease the crisis. French President Emmanuel Macron told his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin that he hopes to avoid war and build elements of stability for everyone. 
Although Ukraine's security is not negotiable, Macron urged for respect for Russia when it comes to defending its own security. Putin warned that Europe will be drawn into military conflicts if Ukraine joins NATO. Saying there would be no winners from the ongoing crisis, the Russian leader added that he'll do everything to find compromises that suit everyone. Again, such a backdrop, Ukraine has reportedly requested Washington deploy that anti-ballistic missile defense systems in the country's east. A Russian news agency quoted a Kremlin spokesperson who warned that such a deployment would further ramp up tensions. Kim Yo-san, Arirang News. Across the border on this Tuesday, North Korea's state-run media reports has reported that is details from a two-day parliamentary session which placed priority on domestic affairs, including pandemic prevention efforts. Kim Dami reports. North Korea reported Tuesday that the regime held a two-day session of its rubber stamp legislature, which ended the previous day. Leader Kim Jong-un was now present at the meeting, meaning no message for South Korea and the U.S. It's the Olympics truce period and Kim sent a congratulatory message to China too. The North has already sent multiple strong messages to the U.S. It will watch for Washington's response for now. Overseen by the leader of the Presidium of the Supreme People's Assembly, Choi ryong hae the latest discussions included increasing expenditure for emergency epidemic prevention work by 33 percent on year in 2022. The North is presuming that the pandemic will be prolonged and feels the need for a separate budget as well as personnel for virus prevention efforts. The sharp rise in funding follows the resumption of trains carrying emergency supplies operating around the North Korea-China border amid the rapid spread of the Omicron variant. While the North has recently declared it's considering resuming nuclear and ICBM testing for the first time since 2018, its defense spending remained unchanged at 15.9 percent for this year, though experts warn there could be a much more unknown defense investment. The North is struggling hard with its economy and there's no room to increase its defense budget. They poured lots of spending and investment in last year, so it's keeping it the same this year. The same also applied to the fields of scientific technology and education, which the Gim regime has prioritized. The budget for the agriculture sector significantly went up, though no specific numbers are known yet. The two-day session also noted that the regime's economy was managed stably despite hurdles to economic development, such as the global health crisis and natural disasters. Kim Dami, Arirang News. In yet another sign of technological advances in modern society, robots have been assigned with the task of cooking at one military camp here. Our parent has more. A series of robots prepare food at a military boot camp. They're capable of deep frying, stir frying, boiling and steaming food. Since last November, these robots have been helping to prepare meals at a boot camp in the city of Nunsan, Chungcheonnam, the province. With the help of these robot chefs, military cooks no longer have to stir-fry foods in hot oil. Instead, they only have to put the ingredients in the pan, and the robot does the rest. This is part of the government's efforts to improve the quality of everyday meals for military service members. This comes after photos of meals uploaded on social media by some service members sparked controversy over the poor quality of food being served to them. The defense minister visited the site on Monday and said, the implementation of robotic services will also reduce the workload and the risk of injury for military cooks. We believe this automated and standardized cooking system will improve the quality of meals for troops. It will also reduce the workload for our military cooks that have to prepare large amounts of food and prevent them from injuries such as burns. Last August, the country's Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy had announced that it will expand the use of robots in the defense industry. The trade and industry minister, who was also at the boot camp on Monday, said it will cooperate with the defense ministry to begin using robots in various defense areas. Peunzi, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. Political delegations from Iran and world powers are due to return to Vienna on Tuesday for what could potentially be the final stretch of efforts to restore the Iran nuclear deal. 
While different sides have said real progress has been made, others say there are still significant hurdles remaining in trying to reach an agreement to revive the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. They include the fact that the Iranian government still refuses to talk directly with the United States, who unilaterally abandoned the deal in 2018. Meanwhile, Iranian officials said Monday that the future of the nuclear deal relies on whether or not Western parties fulfill Tehran's expectations for sanctions relief. Massive bushfires in the Wheat Belt region of Western Australia sent a large plume of smoke and dust into the sky on Sunday, as multiple warnings are in place. According to authorities, the bushfires are moving very quickly, with the state seeing at least half a dozen homes destroyed and over 60,000 hectares of bushland burnt. More than 1,300 people were fighting the blazes, with the vast majority of them volunteers. The massive fire comes as the region faces four level three bushfires occurring at the same time. Over in India, Female Muslim students in the country's southern Karnataka state protested on Monday against the government's latest decision to ban students from wearing hijabs and burqas in colleges. Hundreds of protesters who were seen wearing hijabs and burqas took to the streets demanding the withdrawal of the decision. We will enter wearing hijabs. We will not remove them until we receive a high court order. The protests come as the Karnataka state government last week issued an order imposing a ban on wearing hijabs and burqas, stating that they tend to disturb integrity, equality and public order. As protests took place across the state, one college was seen allowing students wearing hijabs to enter the premises, but they were seated in separate classrooms. Celebrations all across Senegal as the country's national football team received a hero's welcome upon their arrival in Dakar on Monday with the Africa Cup of Nations trophy. The team were met by President Macky Sall, with the government declaring a national holiday to celebrate the historic win. On Sunday, Senegal defeated Egypt on penalties, claiming their first ever Cup of Nations title after falling just short in 2002 and 2019. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. Screening centers are working around the clock to do their part in proactive efforts to contain the latest rebound in cases led by Omicron. Now, to offer you some of the actual scenes, I have Chon Song Cho standing by. Song Cho, it's good to see you again. Good afternoon, Sunny. Right, so Song Cho, which testing site are you joining us from? Yes, I'm at a pop-up screening center here at the Olympic Park in southern Seoul, uh, where people are getting the COVID-19 test. So let's say that you've just arrived here. You'll be able to get the test right away, which is a lot quicker than before. There used to be long lines at every testing center here in Seoul. Uh, however, the lines might have gotten a lot quicker and shorter these days, thanks to the new testing scheme that was adopted last week. So uh, you'll be able to see two lines over there, PCR test and rapid antigen test. So starting last Thursday, in response to the rapid spread of the Omicron variant, uh, only the priority groups will take the PCR test while others take the rapid antigen test. Uh, by priority groups, I mean people who tested positive for the rapid antigen test, people who are uh, 60 or older, people with pre-existing conditions, or people uh, who are traveling into South Korea from other countries. Uh, they will be able to take the PCR test right away, like usual, you know, the deep nasal swab test. However, the majority of other people uh, will take the rapid antigen test. And this is what the test kit looks like. Um, I've already unpacked everything for you and put in a clear plastic bag to show you. Uh, some of you may be familiar with may be familiar with what the test kit looks like because this is exactly the same type as the self test kit that we've been all taking at home. So what happens is uh, you bring this into uh, into the tent, then there will be medical workers who are giving out instructions, helping you all to take this test in an accurate manner. I've already taken this test multiple times, so uh, let me explain to you 
how exactly it works. So first of all, you take this no nasal swab a, and you insert it into your nose about two centimeters deep and give it a really good stir for about five seconds. And then you repeat the same procedure inside the other nostril. And then you take the swab, put it in the extraction tube right here with the fluid inside and then give it another stir uh, for about 10 seconds and then squeeze the tube to make two drops of fluid on uh, drop onto this test strip. Uh, wait for about 15 minutes, then you would be able to see either one line or two lines. One line means you're negative for COVID-19. Two line means you're positive for COVID-19. Well, uh, whichever test you take, PCR or rapid antigen test here, uh, everything is free. However, if you choose to take the test at home yourself, then you'll still have to buy the kit at a, a pharmacy or you would have to go to a local clinic to pay for the test. Um, I mean, I... I think everyone can agree with me here that people are getting fatigued and tired with the pandemic situation. However, uh, it's really mind boggling to see the country's um, daily cases creep up to the uh, 30,000s or 40,000s. But if you visit a local screening center, clinic or hospital, you'll see how tirelessly and selflessly people are working uh, because they know that it's a matter of life or death for some people out there. What we have to do is simple, just wear a mask, uh, practice social distancing, personal hygiene, and then get yourself tested uh, even when you show the slightest symptoms. Uh, you can always go on Smart Soul Map to check out different operating hours for different screening centers. This has been Chun sung Cho reporting live from Olympic Park and back to you, Sunny, in the studio. All right, sung Cho, as always, thank you very much for that report. Authorities here are hoping Omicron will be the final huddle before our transition into a new normal. For more on this hope and related efforts, I have Professor Kim Mungyu from Yonsei University. Professor Kim, it's good to see you again. Thank you for having me. I also have Professor David Kwok from Sun Chung University. It's always a pleasure to have you here, Professor Kwok. Good afternoon, Sunny. Right, Professor Kim, authorities believe the daily tally may hit as high as 170,000 by late this month. Do you agree? I think now we are facing the uh, real... Uh, face of Omicron right now, and uh, I regret, I regard this uh, emergence of Omicron uh, should be that as a totally new phase of this pandemic. And uh, I think we have to fo forget about the uh, COVID-19 of Wuhan strain, and uh, this is Omicron. I, will, I think we can name it as COVID-21 or something. Uh, now everyone is tired, and uh, but there should be no false pre- assumption regarding Omicron uh, is the end of this uh, pandemic. Uh, th there's no way to know Omicron is going to be the start of endemicity. Uh, only high level of immunity of total population is the uh, strongest force toward uh, endemicity. And uh, there are something we have to uh, be careful. I think uh, human behavior can change the course of this uh, uh, situation and uh, we have to correct something like uh, vaccine refusal and maybe somebody will not to wear a mask but uh, still we have to do that and uh, <coughs> politics oriented uh, mentality is something we have to correct and also uh, as the situation is so there i think uh, we have also may think that economy first policy but I think we have to rethink about that. And uh, still we need a, a mature citizenship and uh, a good leadership to overcome this situation. Right, we do. Professor Kwak, authorities on Monday also revealed that the COVID-19 test positivity rate had hit 26%, meaning one out of every four COVID-19 tests had been positive. What are your thoughts on this finding? Well, I think there would be multiples of factors that uh, affected the, the outcome 
uh, that we're finding. Uh, number one, uh, we have changed the method of testing so that only six people who are 60 years and above would be tested through RT-PCR automatically, but for those who are below that, would be tested through rapid antigen test, as you've seen on the screen first. And those who test positive from those will be given the RT-PCR testing, making the, the, uh, the containment of the RT-PCR testing more efficient, which would also mean that they would find higher confirmatory percentage in, in the results, because those people who are more likely to be positive are only being tested with RT-PCR now. Also, the fact that we just overcame the, the holiday season over the past weekend or so would have drastically increased the chances of people being exposed to the virus itself, also increasing the chances that they are positive from the infection. So I think multiples of factors are um, really affecting the numbers, but also at the same time, as uh, Professor Kim already mentioned, we are seeing a very huge peak, uh, not peak, but very steep rise in the, the numbers. So the confirmation cases itself is really drastically rising, even though we're counting barely in around 30 to 40,000 uh, confirmation, uh, confirmation cases, I kind of anticipate that we were, were um, actually uh, should be seeing around 60 to 70,000 possible cases uh, because not all of the people who sh are suspected of having the disease are currently being tested. So if that is so, that would also uh, count into the 20% of the confirmation cases that we are seeing. So the case itself, the infection itself, itself is uh, spreading and transmitting very fast. And it's really taking up the space in the, in the population itself. So I think it's just being represented more efficiently, but also at the same time numerically. Right, I see. Professor Kim, on a slightly reassuring note, however, the number of severely ill patients and fatalities has been retreating. Do you believe this trend will continue even as we continue to see an alarming surge in daily cases? Uh, I think we have ample reason to believe that way because the fatality of Omicron is only 0.16% compared to 0.8% of the Delta variant. But as uh, Professor Kwang mentioned, total confirmed cases are increasing unprecedentedly. And uh, also, the reinfection of patients with pro previous COVID-19 is about five times if you're exposed to uh, Omicron compared to Delta. Uh, it's uh, data from Mayo Clinic. And uh, so it is clear the number of severe cases is, is going to rise. Uh, as we have seen in USA or UK or Israel, other countries. Thankfully, the ICU beds are less than 20% occupied right now. So that's a good news. But yeah, the total number is going to rise and it's going to be like that for a while. So uh, uh, we have to prepare for that situation. Right. Professor Kwok, as Professor Kim mentioned, Israel, it's been a global leader in vaccine rollout, but despite that, the number of critical cases there and that of COVID-19 deaths have been on an upward trend in recent days. How do you explain this phenomenon over in Israel? Well, it's very statistical. Um, so this actually matches to the cases happening in the U.S. when they found uh, over the, the uh, doubling of um, um, uh, admission rates among children with COVID-19, they actually found the children being admitted out of all those cases who are confirmed of the disease were actually lower than before. And I uh, traced back to Israel's case where they went from anything be, uh, around 400 of the daily confirmation cases and it's steeply rised up to about 80,000 per day or per weekly. Now, having said that the CFR, the case fatality ratio, and I must emphasize this is not entirely the correct or most accurate representation of what's happening, but still it's a good measure to um, follow uh, on these cases because it shows us really what's happening uh, uh, in regards to severity of the disease uh, among those who are infected in the actual numbers. The CFR rate actually hung around about 0.4% in Israel usually before the Omicron hit, and it actually went down to 0 03 uh, uh, when the numbers of cases of death and also ICU bed units increased drastically. And this is only up to about January 26th, so it may even rise further back up. But uh, still going back to the original topic, I think uh, the number that's uh, taking up spaces in ICU beds is very likely to happen to us as well. 
but the number itself does not uh, completely represent the severity or the direness of the disease from the Omicron. As also we have seen from the child, uh, children cases in the U.S., because when they mentioned that they were taking up uh, double the spaces that they used to, their rate of admission was actually a half to a third about what's happened but what's been happening before ratio-wise. So we, as uh, Professor Kim mentions, mentioned again, uh, uh, we, in the near future, in about a week of time or a couple of weeks, we should also expect to see the, uh, the numbers actually go up in the ICU capacity, uh, and we should prepare our, ourselves for that as well. Right. Professor Kim, back here in Korea, a new contact tracing system has been introduced as of this past Monday with COVID-19 patients being asked to voluntarily submit related information, which will not be cross-checked by authorities. What do you suppose has prompted this shift in strategy and how does it look to affect this latest resurgence in COVID-19 cases here in the country? Uh, I had a phone call on the way to the studio and uh, one of my uh, friends got infected and he was angry that nobody is interested in him, no, he had no phone call from anybody. But that's the situation right now. It just announced and uh, a lot of people do not understand uh, what is happening. So uh, we are doing this because Omicron is beyond our capacity to deal with. And our government seems to learn very fast from other countries suffering from Omicron outbreak. And uh, if we say the, uh, talk about the uh, data from USA, uh, they compared the uh, outbreak of the uh, 2021 winter time to this one, and uh, Omicron caused about four times of cases and two times of admission and 1.5 times of mortality. It's rising like uh, exponentially. But uh, <coughs> uh, that's the reason why uh, we can no longer con control this outbreak by tracing and testing and etc. So uh, there are multiple factors affecting this outbreak. And uh, first of all, the human factor, uh, we have to be honest about uh, our symptoms. So uh, you, you have to announce any kind of uh, symptoms you have. And uh, the government factor, I think we need more efforts uh, to publicly announce what is changing. And uh, if it doesn't work out, we, we have to upgrade and uh, make it work out a, as much as we can. Right. Professor Kwok, there's also been a change in the treatment of COVID-19 patients at home, of course. Those who are not in the high-risk category are being asked to take care of themselves, as my colleague Min Jung mentioned earlier. How do you respond to this shift? Well, I personally generally welcome the general direction of uh, what's going to change. Uh, I also think that we need to focus primarily on the more vulnerable people, who obviously would be the people of elderly ages or people with uh, underlying diseases, heavy underlying diseases, that is. But I kind of question as to how hastily this was done, uh, because it seems like those people who will now be covered with oral pills uh, the age groups of it does not necessarily match who are uh, to be taken care of at home because we're uh, uh, setting the age limit to those uh, to be cared at home to be 60 and above, but yet are planning to give the oral pills to 50 and above. I personally think that the at home treatment should also be applied to 50 and above who with underlying diseases and even to those people who need uh, very close monitoring, such as people with congenital disease or, or uh, uh, bed risk in patients and whatnot. So um, even though I do um, um, agree with the general idea of what the government is uh, directing, uh, I also uh, uh, feel that the government is kind of um, doing this so by the minute, as opposed to planning ahead, uh, uh, assuring the general population that they are completely taking care of what should be handled. So I think hopefully in the near future, the government will be able to come out more clearly uh, in its explanation of why they're taking these steps and also what could be done by the population to better handle the situation, such as that for, uh, as Professor Kim mentioned, uh, for those people who are currently contained at home, who are to be taken care of, of themselves, they do not have a clear idea what to do with the disease. If they're to be sick, it's, it's a general um, guidance that they are to call the general clinic. But what 
could the general clinic do for them other than contacting the, the government uh, um, officials or, or, or the health clinics? So, uh, I, and I personally don't think that the general clinics even have a clearest idea on how to handle the general patients. So I think um, it, it should be more efficiently done so as, a, 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 as in planning the protocol or explaining to the general population why they're doing this, the purpose of this steps and so on, so that the people could understand what they can do for themselves in, uh, among the taking this, uh, of the steps, uh, not only for them uh, treating for themselves, but also for those people who need uh, treatment from higher up um, medical facilities. Right. And keeping in mind the concerns raised by Prof Professor Kwak, Professor Kim, what do you recommend to ensure an effective at-home treatment campaign? Um, I think most of the young people will be okay. They will be okay staying home. But uh, you have to know uh, where you can contact uh, the clinics that's uh, seeing the patients, confirmed patients, and you might have to know the phone numbers. You can contact during daytime and also during the nighttime. And uh, if, the, if you are getting worse, like a high fever or chest discomfort or dyspnea, you have to call them. But um, uh, I think uh, there's a small device called oximetry, which checks the uh, saturation, uh, oxygen saturation of, uh, from your finger. I think people might need that. Uh, I think there's a kit and it is included in it, but uh, some people who is not uh, getting that kit might have to prepare by themselves. And uh, you have to install the uh, application in your mobile phone and uh, give answers to the symptoms you have. There are some medications like uh, Tylenol, some antipyretics, which might be necessary. And some physicians recommend vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, but as an only minor effect. Usually, I would recommend that kind of uh, medications for people who are not sick yet, yet but exposed to uh, confirmed patients as a family member or something. And. Uh, the most important thing I would recommend is hydration. You have to keep yourself hydrated. Uh, you have to drink more water than uh, usual times, unless you have some kidney problems. And you can check it by urination. Should be plenty and should be very uh, should not be uh, yellow colored or uh, dark colored. Right, and staying with medication, Professor Kwak, as you mentioned, the expanded use of Paxlovid to include all those age 50 and above. What are some things to bear in mind? Well. So this disease seems to have preferences in the what, uh, what kinds of underlying diseases that they target. It seems like people, even in younger age groups, um, people who suddenly turn severe or possibly even die from the disease tend to be either obese or have diabetes or have conditions that affects the brain that they're taking heavy medicines uh, to keep um, uh, from having seizures. So those people who are taking those medications should be clearly aware of what kind of medications they're currently taking because Paxlovid is a medicine that takes a huge toll in the liver function. Uh, two parts to the medication. One part actually is a liver function decreasing agent to elongate the effect of the other. So which means that it's intentionally decreasing the metabolism, metabolism through liver. That being said, people who are taking medications that are also uh, metabolized through liver should be clearly aware just in case that they, they get infected so that they could tell the appropriate doctors to make decisions on whether or not to uh, be given the Paxlovid or to be even not be given Paxlovid because in very rare cases, people who are taking, let's say, anti-seizure medication should not be given Paxlovid at all. Those are people who are contraindicated, so to speak. So uh, people who are currently taking these certain medication, uh, they need to go through these, each medication and see if they would be meta uh, liver metabolized, number one. Number two, they should be able to tell their doctors once if they get infected that they're taking certain medications. Right, I see. Moving forward, Professor Kim, the academic arena has been granted authority with regard to learning amid Omicron and also the handling of infections within its grounds. What are your thoughts on this autonomous arrangement? They announced that the, uh, they're going to follow a 315 rule, which means 3% of students infected or 15% of infected or quarantined is reached. You, you, uh, uh, you can stop a school. 
But uh, I would like to quote from uh, Little Prince. It says that what is essential is invisible to the eye. So I mean, there are going to be a lot of asymptomatic uh, students. And uh, there was a small study from uh, M Imperial College London. They uh, did a COVID-19 human challenge trial, including 36 uh, candidates. And uh, about half of them were infected, but there were some a few numbers had a, a asymptomatic infections also. So uh, I think school needs to keep that strict rules of social distancing inside class, uh, wearing masks and hand washing and disinfected uh, toilets and everything. And I'm a little bit worried about the uh, quality control of PCR test if it's done at school. And uh, each school has to decide whether uh, what kind of decision they're going to make. It's going to be a big burden and cause a lot of confusion for the students and the parents. So I think it's going to need upgrade uh, their st strategy soon. Right. And staying with schools and the concerns this time raised by Professor Kim. Professor Kwok, what do you propose to allow for a safe learning environment as schools embrace a, this new health responsibility? Well, number one is boosting up the vaccination rate, obviously. And as I've said before, I think Korea's, uh, Korea government should uh, uh, expedite the process to allow children of uh, ages between 5 to 11 to be allowed to receive um, COVID-19 vaccine because there are a certain group of children who are congenitally diseased, who are more prone to having it more severe, those people still need this vaccination. So, but not only for those people who are to about, about to attend um, schools as well, some people, obviously children would be much better protected through vaccination, even if it's not mandated. So we need to boost up the vaccination rate, number, four, number one. Number two, as I iterate all the time, it's ventilation, it's physical aspect that also has huge impact on the transmission of virus. So even your, if you are at school, open up the windows and keep it open all the time. But also, if you can, take all or almost all kinds of activities outside. That way, it, uh, it, it's, it'll be much lesser chance for the virus to transmit to others, keeping the children safe as well. Right. So seek to vaccinate if you can. Keep windows open mm -hmm. and seek to keep activities outdoors. Yes. Right. Professor Kwok, as always, thank you very much for your thoughts. Professor Kim, thank you for your thoughts as well. Thank you. Right. Well, daily infections are forecast to maintain the upward trend in the days ahead. So do seek to abide by safety protocols. Thank you for watching.